Okay, let's get to our panel. With me here in the studio is Brian Becker. He's visited the DPRK several times. He's an analyst on US career relations and no strangers to this show. He's also author of The Imperialism in the 21st Century. Also with us from Beijing is Tong Zhao. He's a fellow at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. And joining us via Skype is Peter Kuznick. He's professor of history at American University and is co-author of the Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States. And also with us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, is Myungku Kang. He is professor of political science at Baruch College. Welcome all of you to the Thank show. You. I want to start actually with Peter and play a bit of that uh, documentary that he did with uh, 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 Oliver Stone, The Untold History. The reason is, is because this kind of sets up the historical context of where we are. It's about the Korean War and also US policy there. Let, let's just watch it and then, Peter, I'll get your reaction off the back. World War II hero General Douglas MacArthur had pushed north towards the Chinese border, despite repeated warnings from Beijing assuring Truman that the Chinese would never enter the war. In the late fall of 1950, hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops streamed across the Yalu River, sending U.S. and Allied forces reeling backwards in a frantic retreat. The Marines who spearheaded the breakout did not consider it a retreat. Retreat hell, said their commander. We're just advancing in a different direction. Time magazine called it the worst defeat the U.S. had ever suffered. Truman wrote in his diary, World War III is here. MacArthur repeatedly and Truman separately threatened to use the bomb. And by bomb, they mean nuclear weapons. And also, uh, we didn't have time to play it there, but uh, uh, the US also threatened to bomb Chinese ports and also uh, bring in the KMT back to the Chinese mainland. So there's all this sort of, uh, of stuff going on. Uh, Peter, how do you think what you wrote there, that documentary, sort of fits in to this tension era we're now in? Well, Americans tend to not have very much historical memory. But people in other parts of the world have much greater historical memory. And North Koreans remember this history. They remember the Korean War. They know that the United States attacked them. Not only did the United States attack them, the United States leveled North Korea to the ground. The United States' preferred weapon of choice there was napalm. Uh, but we firebombed all of North Korea's cities. Uh, the consequences were simply devastating. And that, literally, every city in North Korea was burned to the ground. Uh, the death toll, we don't have an exact death toll in that war, but the estimates, the best estimates I've seen, is that three to four million Koreans died, a million Chinese died, and 37,000 or so Americans died. So th this was not a, a simple war. We're talking about a tenth of the population of Korea, north and south, um, was right. killed in that, in that war. So they have a memory of this. And to them, they know that the United States has been threatening, that the United States has been threatening again to use nuclear weapons, that we were seriously considering using nuclear weapons during the original Korean War, uh, and that... Now, it was not only MacArthur. One of the mistakes people make is they think MacArthur was fired by Truman because he was threatening to use nuclear weapons. That was, that was not why MacArthur got fired. In fact, when Ridgway took over from MacArthur, he immediately called for the use of 38 okay. nuclear weapons. Uh, Peter, this is a great historical background. I, I want to bring in our other guests to, to talk about this. Let's uh, talk to Myungku Kang in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, given the long historical memory between uh, North and South, how much of what happened in the Korean War is still part of the thinking in today's tensions uh, from Seoul's point of view? I mean, those old people who still remember the Korean War, it's a big deal. And then still, those old people, for instance, more than 70 years old, they mm. vividly remember the Korean War and devastating consequences of the war. So here in the United States, the Korean War is a kind of forgotten war. But in the Korean context, it is still very, very critical in political and historical aspect. Because many people have been killed, were killed because of the Korean War. So some people should take a political responsibility about the, about the war itself. 
Uh, let's go to Beijing. Uh, Tong Zhao, uh, obviously the Korean War is not a forgotten war when it comes to Chinese history. Uh, and uh, in terms of the historical experience that we've had over the last 70 years, there, it hasn't always been one of confrontation, has it? There have been periods, uh, for example, in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, where it looked like we could have seen uh, the end of nuclear ambitions of the DPRK and some sort of ending of this war and uh, security guarantees. What happened and why did it go wrong? Well, indeed, uh, throughout history, there were multiple uh, occasions in which uh, we almost uh, came to a full resolution of the North Korean nuclear crisis. The first case came in 1994 when the framework agreement was reached. The problem at that time was, even though the White House was very interested in uh, implementing the agreement, the U.S. Congress, especially when the Congress was later controlled and dominated by the Repub Republicans, they really hated this agreement and mm. threatened to withdraw, just like what we have witnessed after the recent Iran nuclear deal was signed. So from the okay. North Korean perspective, they really doubted the U.S. capability to implement the agreement. Therefore, they felt they couldn't trust the U.S. in the future. So they decided they had to uh, sought another route towards developing a nuclear capability. So the similar uh, dynamics played out multiple times. It, the lack of uh, trust between the major stakeholders really contributed to the failures of previous agreements. Uh, Brian Becker, do you agree with that? If you take um, where the Korean Peninsula is in, in a historical context, obviously we had the Korean War, but we also we had the Vietnam War, for example, uh, with the US. We had the Cold War, where so the Soviet Union was largely the protector of the DPRK, and that came to an end with the end of, of the Soviet Union. So where, what, what does history advise us about where we are now? Uh, right after the Soviet Union fell, the United States policymakers believed firmly that North Korea would fall too, that there would be regime change. North Korea wasn't going to fall. It learned the lesson of what happened in the Soviet Union. It adopted what they called as a military first policy. Mm. That led to a near war in 1994. That then was resolved with the General Framework Agreement. From there, you had the North Koreans agreeing to suspend nuclear weapons development. And there was the Kim Dae-jung government in South Korea, the Sunshine Policy, leading to a possible rapprochement in 1999, Meeting 2000. in 2000. Met, yeah. Kim Jong-il and Kim Dae-jung met together. And Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of State, went to Pyongyang and met with uh, Kim Jong-il. If the Clinton administration had been in power for another year, I think there would have been a normalization. But George W. Bush came in, he treated Kim Dae-jung rudely, and he proclaimed North Korea as part of the axis of evil, along with Iran and Iraq, prepared to, dis to invade a disarmed Iraq and North Korea said, well, guess what? We're leaving the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and we are getting nuclear weapons. And since then, the situation has frozen. There could have been a change. There could have been negotiations. There still can be a change. It's going to be on a different basis, though. Uh, Peter, do you agree with that, that, that some of the DPRK's reactions were because uh, of U.S. reactions post-Cold War uh, instead of moving to, to settle uh, this long simmering conflict that actually tensions rose up? I agree with Brian. Yes, there was an eight-year period there when North Korea froze its plutonium production. They abandoned it. They gave up their nuclear programs. They were hoping for a peaceful settlement with the United States. First of all, they wanted to, once and for all, end the Korean War. You know, the war ended with an armistice. There was never a peace treaty at the end of that war. Hence, no security guarantees for the North. Yeah, oh, no. and, then, and they wanted, what they were wanted, and even now, their demands are fairly straightforward. They want an end to the U.S. Uh, and South Korean war games that are going on constantly. Mm. You have to look at this from the perspective of, uh, of, of the North Koreans. When the U.S. invaded Iraq, the North Koreans said that the only mistake that Saddam Hussein made was not having nuclear weapons. If Saddam had nuclear weapons, they, the United States could not have invaded. They drew the same lesson from Libya. Libya, yes. Yep. What, did, what did Gaddafi do? He gave up his weapons of mass destruction, abandoned his nuclear and other programs, 
and then the United States supports the overthrow and uh, and Gaddafi's death. 